Okay, everybody, then let us start from the very beginning, a very good place to start. Uh, welcome. I'm so glad that you found us. So my name is Victoria Moran, and I have been a vegan since 1983 and a vegetarian since 1969. And I feel like I ought to say, and I'm still alive. <laughs> and I, I've raised a child, a, a lifelong vegan she now works as a stunt performer and an aerialist. And because we're having COVID and jobs are scarce, she is currently working as a stilt walker <laughs> at Bush Gardens in Florida. All this to say that there used to be the idea that vegans were wimpy. Well, we are not wimpy anymore. So a little bit of my story is that I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, where we were known for stockyards. A side of beef was a sign of civic pride. And it just never occurred to me that there was anything wrong with that until I came home from first grade with the four food groups. That they were the nutritional gold standard of the time, and half of them were animal products. And my nanny, my grandmother age nanny, who was somebody who didn't like the government telling people what to do, said, Humph, why, there are some people who never eat meat. They're called vegetarians. And I could take you to a restaurant and get you a hamburger made out of peanuts and you would think you were having beef. And we never went to the restaurant. But somehow that idea just really stayed with me that not only was it possible to be vegetarian, but that there were probably lots of other amazing things in the world that I might not learn about in school. So I've been at this a while. I was a practicing binge eater when I discovered all this stuff. And through the process of interchange through a recovery program and switching to a, a fully plant-based diet, I left 60 pounds uh, and binge eating behind me back in the Reagan administration. And the difficulties, the health difficulties with uh, cholesterol and, and high blood pressure and those kinds of things that people in my family on both sides had well before they were the age that I am now, I just don't have. And I always say, you know, this is earth. And it's not perfect. And so I could do the same class a year from now and I could say, you know what, I had to go on XYZ drug. I don't know. But right now, uh, I, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm doing fine without any kind of uh, medical supervision at um, the age of 70. And I think that eating in this way has a lot to do with it. But that's not why I did it. I did it because I really care about the animals. And now I see that all of us are really needing to care about this planet because there is a strong uh, connection there, according to the UN and the World Bank. The animal agriculture industry produces more greenhouse gases than all transportation combined. I was just watching the recorded Bill Maher from last night, and Jane Fonda was there talking about, you know, climate and all that. And you can't help but admire somebody and their plastic surgeon for looking that great <laughs> when they're over 80. And, and yet she just doesn't get it that she needs to stop eating chicken and fish. You know, a lot of people kind of hide behind chicken and fish. And we will talk about um, why and uh, why I think we need to rethink that. So I'm going to go into screen share mode right now. And we'll just follow through with the PowerPoint. So all the visual learners will have something to focus on. Let's see if I'm getting this right. Looks like it. Okay. So this, this wonderful whale is just such a great image of, of what's oh, going on. on. Hello? Oops. Uh, could, could everybody mute, please? Uh, there's somebody talking in the background, which is always uh, difficult for me. Thank you so much. So for the whales and for the little mice and <laughs> for everybody in between. We want to be taking care of, of this planet. 
So I want to start with a little history and then we're going to get into some uh, health and some nutrition and then some food, glorious food. And then I do, as I said, want to leave uh, plenty of time in this 90 minutes for Q&A. So we are going to start by looking back. And one way to do that is to look at human anatomy. There is a discipline that one can study in colleges and universities called comparative anatomy. And that means we look at other beings who are more and less like us and determine what we need to be doing for ourselves. So these beautiful fellows are bonobo apes. The bonobos are just a magnificent culture. <laughs> There's so much we could learn from them. We are very, very closely related to them uh, by DNA and, and, and by anatomy. And they're a really interesting group. They're pacifistic. <laughs> they're matriarchal. They're, they're really cool. And, and like the other anthropoid apes, the bonobos are strict vegetarians. And we always read, well, you know, chimps get some grubs and some termites and that. Sure, so does anybody who's ever been to a Labor Day picnic. But these bonobos seem to be very committed <laughs> to their vegan identity uh, because they don't seem to even go for the little uh, uh, bugs or, or anything. They eat fruits, roots, berries, seeds, bark, sprouts, and, and, and look at them. They're just fine. And our anatomy is very, very much like theirs. And, and this is for whether you're a, a Darwinian or whether you're a creationist, you know, you could, you don't have to believe in evolution to understand that we are very much like these creatures. And some of the ways that we're like them is that we have grinding molars. People will say to you, but we have canine teeth. You know, these two little bitty tiny things couldn't tear a, a apart a, a, a little squirrel. I mean, <laughs> they're, they're not killer teeth. Just because somebody decided to give them the name canine. We're not designed with our hands, with our teeth to kill just about anybody. And, and we have these grinding molars for grinding the plant material. We also have tylen, which is a digestive enzyme in our saliva that is there to start breaking down carbohydrate and turning those starches that are hard to digest into sugars so that the body can use them. We also have a really, 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 really long digestive tract. And that is so that we can process all of that plant material, all that wonderful fiber that we need um, through our systems, digest, keep what we need, and eliminate the rest. Now, if you look at the anatomy of a carnivore or an omnivore, um, it's very different. So a carnivore, as you know, we know those are, are wolves and cats and creatures of, of that sort, little bitty short digestive tracts. So you can feed your dog and take him out for his walk half an hour later and he's going to need to poop because that's all the time it takes when your digestive tract is, is that long. And that's because even though these animals have very strong digestive acids to take care of rotting material so that they're not harmed by bacteria. I mean, the stuff my dog picks up on the street before I can get it out of his mouth utterly amazes me, almost never makes him sick. It would make us really sick. So we are designed to eat plants. And you can look at this from the comparative anatomy point of view. You can also look at it from a cultural, anthropological, and even history of religions point of view, uh, both Eastern and Western. And I'll just start here with the Bible because everybody is probably familiar with that. And I did hear a beep. So Perita, thank you for letting people in. So this is from the first chapter of the first book of the Hebrew Bible, or what Christians call the Old Testament. And it's when uh, God was talking with Adam and Eve and said, I give you every plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. So to me, this is utterly fascinating. And you certainly do not have to be any kind of 
biblical literalists to find this interesting. Whoever wrote this back in, in the uh, days of antiquity saw that in some kind of idyllic idea of what life on earth was supposed to be like, it was supposed to be vegan. And what's really interesting about this is that Eden was vegan. Even the animals that are now <laughs> carniv carnivorous, in the Eden story, everybody ate plants. Now, what's interesting, if you really take this verse apart, you can see that the plants that were given for the humans were fruits and fruit-like vegetables. So things like uh, tomatoes and, and peppers that have the seed in them. And I think of this as the Hawaiian vacation diet. So if anybody's ever traveled in, in the tropics, what do you want to eat? You know, there's avocados coming off the trees. There's guavas coming off the trees. Who wants to go in and <clears throat> fix grains and beans. Uh, but when you're in different circumstances, different things become appropriate. And it's interesting enough, we don't have time to go into a lot of history about um, how vegetarianism came to be on, on the planet. But it is interesting in um, the book of Genesis and going further on um, into that, that after the fall, when sickness and death entered the picture, then God told Adam and Eve, they were still supposed to be vegan, but they would add in the vegetables. They would add in the green vegetables. And I think about this every time I see a t-shirt that says only kale can save us now. And, and I do find it fascinating that somebody figured out once you get sickness and death, then you really need those leafy greens. Now, in a completely different culture, we have the ancient yogis. And I think of these rishis, these wise teachers from ancient India as the world's first nutritionists. So when they talked about the kinds of foods that people should be eating, it's so similar to what much of the cutting edge science is saying right now. And what's fascinating about the yogis is that they came at this from two points of view. They came at it from an ethical point of view and from what we would think of as a nutritional point of view. So ethically, the very first moral precept in yoga is ahimsa, and that is non-harming. The idea is that if you're serious about your spiritual life and your spiritual growth, you just don't want to hurt anybody. And that is anybody of any species. And so you certainly don't want to eat them. But in addition, the yogis were looking at all the ways that would help people on a spiritual path. So if you're somebody who really wants to put a lot of time into meditation and, and, and spiritual contemplation and that kind of thing, you're going to not need to be all nervous and jittery and, and fidgety. And there are foods that, that lead to that. And, and those foods are, are highly spiced and really salty and um, lo lots of uh, eggs, lots of caffeine. And then on the other side, you've got foods that just make you sleepy and tired and not very interested in helping others or in, in your own growth. And those kinds of foods are the ones that are old and stale, fermented, uh, alcoholic beverages, aged cheeses, and certainly meat because it's, it's in the decomposition process um, by the time that, that you're able to eat it. So the yogi said we should be eating fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, and milk from healthy cows. Now, obviously, this is a vegan lecture, so um, I'm not someone who is in favor of, of drinking milk. It's very, very difficult in the world as it is now to get anything that would be considered milk from healthy cows. There are some people uh, in, in India and the U.S. Who, who have these kind of prototype uh, ways for raising cows and the babies get to stay with the mom and the boys aren't sent off to be veal and when the mom can't give milk anymore she gets to stay and live. Well that's what most people think happens for all cows. That's what happens to almost no 
cows. It is almost impossible to get what I would think of today as karma-free milk. So with all due respect to the yogis, uh, the first five food groups are the ones that I focus on, and I call those the five fitness food groups. We'll be getting to those in a minute. Now, in yet another way, this is going to again be Western, but we're going to be looking at somebody who's not from the religious point of view, but from the philosophical point of view, and that is Pythagoras. So Pythagoras, you know, he was the guy with the theorem, but he was also a mathematician. In addition to being a mathematician, he was a philosopher. He was an athletic coach. And if you were going to study with Pythagoras in any of these disciplines, you had to first do a 40-day water fast, and then you had to do, agree for the time that you were working with him to go on what we would now call a raw food vegan diet. <laughs> Because he thought that to be able to process the kind of information he was offering people, that you really needed what he considered to be the ultimate diet in order to do that. But just like we talked about the yogis were looking at the best way to eat for spiritual growth, Pythagoras, and also uh, looking at it ethically, Pythagoras the same, for as long as man continues to be the ruthless destroyer of lower living beings, he will never know health or peace. For as long as men massacre animals, they will kill each other. Indeed, he who sows the seeds of murder and pain cannot reap joy and love. I don't think that's changed very much uh, since then. So, we're going to move on and look at these beings who do have the most invested. So we're going to look first at cows. So, so many people say, I don't eat red meat, I don't eat red meat. And, you know, every step is absolutely wonderful. But from an ethical point of view, cows in the beef industry really, I don't want to say have it the best, they have it the least worst of animals in the meat industry in general because um, they get to stay with uh, the, the babies get to stay with the mothers and um, you know some people say well they just have one bad day uh, i'm not sure i would go that far because even in small farms organic farms there are customary practices you know a lot of people say but aren't there laws that protect animals well there are but the laws exclude customary practices. So let's say that there were laws to protect children, but they excluded certain awful things that people in the past have done to children. I'm not going to even say what some of these things are, but you can imagine. And so people could be doing these awful things, but they would be within the law because those awful things were done so commonly that they're exempted. So customary farming practices include things like uh, tail docking, ear docking, castration without anesthesia. And, and that's just normal. And that's on a good kind of, of uh, farm or, or ranch. And then in the dairy industry, we also get into the separation of mother and baby. It's an interesting thing. I'm of the age that I came through the women's liberation movement and having it all and all that. Well, for a cow, having it all is having her baby. I mean, they are the most family oriented of any species. And within three days of birth and sometimes immediately after birth, the cow and the calf are separated. And this even happens on the so-called humane farms or the small farms or the good farms. Um, the reason being that once the mother has produced the colostrum, she's commercially viable. You know, we don't want this baby getting the milk that could be sold. And this is not just a super modern factory farming kind of idea. I was in upstate New York for an event a few years ago, and I was in one of these little cafes that was selling all kinds of antique stuff. And one of the antique containers was a, a metal can that contained baby calf formula from 1910. 
So they had already figured out that they could make more money by feeding the babies something that was more artificial and, and keeping the milk for sale. So you can read all kinds of accounts of how the mother and, and the baby uh, scream and, and they're just in, in such distress. And this isn't something that just happens once. It's something that happens annually. What a lot of people don't understand, unless you grew up on a, a farm and, and really have thought about it, is a cow is not a milk machine. A cow is a female mammal. So female mammals include women. We can make milk, but we don't just make milk our whole lives. We make milk after we have a baby. Well, that's what cows do. If you've ever had a, a cat that had kittens, the cat makes milk while the kittens are of, of the nursing age. And then she doesn't make milk anymore. And one of the most enlightening experiences I ever had was in a veterinarian's office looking at a little sign that just showed the nutrient content of the milks of various mammals. Because we never think about anybody making milk except cows and maybe goats, and then of course women if we have a baby. But whales make milk, and it's the highest in fat of any milk of any mammal because this baby has to grow to be really big and be kept warm in a, in a cold ocean. And you think about all the mammals, even bats. Bats fly and they make milk for their babies. Cows make milk milk for their babies. And that certainly, in my opinion, it, it's not only the vegan party line, it's my opinion that, um, you know, that, that's who it's for. And in virtually all circumstances, um, I, I want to respect that. Then we're going to move into chickens. And, you know, when people say, well, I don't eat red meat, sometimes I just want to say, Oh, maybe you could kind of eat some red meat and save the chickens. The reason being that a cow is a very large animal. And if people are going to eat meat, you can get a lot of burgers from one carcass. But with chickens, they're a little tiny. And so just to get some McNuggets or, you know, the big chicken on Sunday afternoon that's pretty much all and everything. That's pretty much a life here. Now, just like in uh, the case of the cows where we have something different going on in the beef industry and the dairy industry, um, it's the same with chickens. So, uh, oh, and I made a, a goof here. I said egg and dairy industries, my apologies, egg and meat industries. I'll need to fix that. So the chickens that are raised for meat in the industry, they're called broilers. And um, most of them are raised in factory farm conditions. And so many people are always looking for the, the label that says humane or free range or something like that. But those labels are not legally um, looked into. You can pretty much slap that label on any kind of meat or, or any kind of, of eggs. So the problems again it's terrible to be a, a broiler chicken you're you're debeaked your your um, toes are cut off uh, to keep uh, from what the industry calls vices in these tightly uh, cramped situations you're fed in the non-organic um, farms lots of, of drugs and prophylactic antibiotics and you know that's probably a good thing as long as we're going to have this kind of farming simply because of, of the danger of um, air um, animal zoonotic uh, diseases so obviously we're you've got covid going on now which most likely came through the wild animal trade, through a, a bat to a pangolin, an animal that most of us had never heard of, an animal that looks like an anteater, and that was uh, being sold in, in that wet market in, in China. But wet markets exist in the U.S. as well. And the, the farms, the kinds of uh, close proximity that these animals are in are very, very dangerous. The Spanish flu, so-called Spanish flu of 1918 to 1920, wasn't Spanish at all. 
it was started on a farm in Kansas. And they're not sure if it was a chicken farm or a pork farm. <laughs> just know it was a farm in Kansas. And now, of course, we're looking at diseases like swine flu, which is pretty bad, and avian flu, which is really, really, really bad, highly contagious, highly virulent. If you're interested in, in this topic, there is a book by Michael Greger, G-R-E-G-E-R-M-D, called How to Survive a Pandemic. He was on my uh, podcast, Main Street Vegan. You can check that out and just look there in the archives. I think it was about maybe um, eight weeks ago that he was on talking about how to survive a pandemic. But in the case of the chickens themselves, the first horrible thing that happens in the egg industry is that at hatching, you, you get separated by sex. And there are actually people, their job is called sexer, and they look to see if it's a boy chick or a girl chick. And this is one of those things where neither group wins, because if you're a boy, you are immediately killed by suffocation or maceration, and that's exactly what you think you heard. And that's instantly. It's like, hello, world, I just hatched. Well, no, you're not. That's the end of you, because you have no value in the egg industry. And yet, the little girls are going to be into this life that is absolute hell. And people always want to talk about, but you know, my, my neighbor up the road and she's so good to her chickens and when they can't lay anymore, they're just pets. And you know, that's fine, except those chickens come from the very same places that the factory farm chickens come from. It's all this, this industry that's tied together. So I choose for that reason not to consume chickens or eggs. Now to move on to fishes. And I do like to say fishes instead of fish because we have this idea that these creatures, simply because they live in the water, aren't individuals. They're just fish, like we're just people, like, like some vast mass that, that doesn't have personal interests. We've also been fed a lot of ideas about fishes that are simply untrue. There is the, well, your goldfish doesn't really need any stimulation because every three seconds he thinks everything is new. That's not true. These guys are fully functioning adults in their own species, designed to live in their environment and have the experiences that they are having. There is a book by an ethologist that's an animal behaviorist. His name is Jonathan Balcombe, B-A-L-C-O-M-B-E, and it's called What a Fish Knows. And I have to tell you, that is the most fascinating read. There's so much going on with these beings. One of the stories that I, I really like the most, because science has been looking a lot at, at fish lately, is, is some of the, the species of ocean fish do, they, they start businesses and, and they do grooming of other fishes because I guess they get little, you know, nasty things on them. And so certain kinds of fish can suck those off. And what they have seen is that the Fishes that are really good at their job, that don't nip too close and, and you know, do a good job of it, they get more business. The other fish say, no, go to that guy. He's really good at grooming. It's kind of like how we'd recommend a, a hairdresser. And so all this is going on. And in addition to what's happening to the fishes themselves, there is the whole ocean environment and the absolute horror that according to most uh, researchers who, who study this sort of thing, if current fishing habits continue, there will be no fishes in the sea by the year 2040. So just think about that. In, in the first time in all of history, no fishes in the sea. There's also a very scary... Um, a prediction from scientists that there will soon be more plastic by weight in the sea than fishes. This is absolutely horrifying. And so many people think, but fish is good for you. It's not. 
it is the most toxic food that you can eat. If anybody has been pregnant in recent years, your doctor probably gave you a limit of how much fish that you eat because of the amount of mercury and arsenic and other toxins that get into to these little creatures. So we do not want to be eating them. And people say, but what about omega-3s? Well, we're going to talk about omega-3s. Uh, you can get um, the omega-3 ALA from food, from um, flax seeds, chia seeds, walnuts, uh, hemp seeds, soy products. And then you can get the fully formed uh, EPA, DHA fatty acids in a supplement derived from algae. So you don't need fish, you don't need fish oil capsules. There's also this idea, you know, but I only eat wild salmon. It's very difficult to get wild salmon because the fish farms are actually roped off in the oceans. They're not like fish farms over on somebody's back lot. They're there in the ocean. And, and the farmed fish and, and farmed fishing, oh my God, it's a terrible, terrible uh, situation. Not just for salmon is in the ocean. Some of the others are in other, even worse places, indoors, filthy, disease-ridden, lots of antibiotics being given to the fishes. But these, these salmon that, that are out there in, in the ocean, in the farms and not on the farms, they get together. They interbreed. So people who think they're having this wild fish are not necessarily having that. There was a, a documentary about that, and it was an interesting makeup, made up word that I will either think of by the end of, of this um, talk, or I will put it in a, um, in a newsletter. I'm just going to go down here and show you if you don't get the Main Street Vegan newsletter and blog, here's how you can get it. You text 55444 in your phone, and then when it answers back, you, you, you put in the code vegan, your, your message is vegan, and um, then they'll ask you for your email. That'll get you on the list. You'll get this free, your little immuno guide plus soul calming tips. Uh, and also in the very next uh, newsletter, I will recommend that film. Yeah, it's something like Finalicious or something, but that's not it. That's not even close. So anyway, that's how you can get on the newsletter or you can just write to me and we'll figure it out. Okay, moving on. Nutrition and health with plant foods. We've talked about how our food choices affect those who wind up on our plates. And now we're going to talk about our own plates and our own health and what this uh, has to do for us. So science is definitely on our side. Now, I understand anybody can do a study and there's all kinds of people looking at things in different ways. But the overwhelming bulk of the science, and we're talking good science, that doesn't come from the industry or any industry, is, as Kaiser Permanente stated in 2014, healthy eating may be best achieved with a plant-based diet, which we define. And I'm so glad they did, because sometimes plant-based is a, a very... Uh, nebulous kind of phrase, which we define as a regimen that encourages whole plant-based foods and discourages meat, dairy products, and eggs, as well as all refined and processed foods. Now, what's interesting about this is Kaiser Permanente is a managed care organization. And that means that the more their members stay well, the less money they have to spend. So they profit from wellness instead of from sickness. So they are in the business of keeping people well. And it's fascinating that they went so far as to say this. However, this is not some kind of brand new thing that we just came up with eight or nine years ago. This is an interesting quotation. A pure vegetarian diet, which means vegan, can prevent 90% of our thromboembolic disease, that means heart disease, and 97% of our coronary occlusions, that means heart attacks. And this was the Journal of the American Medical Association, January 1961. I mean, 
it, that was almost the 50s. That, <laughs> that, that was another age. And yet people who really looked into this got it. And I am hearing, hearing beeps that people are, are joining in, people who had been given the wrong link. So please know everybody that the, um, the whole class is being recorded. And so you can be in touch with, with Jamie at um, her email is media at MainStreetVegan.net. And just let her know that you need the recording. And anybody who's listening, of course, uh, can uh, have the recording as well. Just please uh, know that this is my copyrighted stuff. So I don't think anybody would use it as their own, but uh, need to say that. Okay, let's move forward. So a whole food plant-based diet has been shown and documented, and we know that it can play a role in preventing or treating. And actually, I didn't say reversing because we don't know, for example, Alzheimer's. We do not know that a diet can do anything to reverse Alzheimer's. However, it can do a lot to prevent it, possibly slow it. But some of these things can actually be reversed. Obesity coronary disease, type 2 diabetes, certain autoimmune disorders in certain people, we talked about the Alzheimer's and dementia, and inflammatory conditions. And when you look at this, this is what is, is costing us so much money. This is what is at the heart of the healthcare crisis. And when we think about healthcare, we're not really thinking about health. We're thinking about illness care. What are we going to do when people get sick? well, how about prevent some of this stuff before it happens? So just looking at this list, obesity is very complex. And certainly as somebody who suffered with that for the first 33 years of my life, I know that it, there's a lot to it. I wrote a book called The Love Powered Diet, uh, Eating for Freedom, Health, and Joy. So if anybody deals with, with binge eating, emotional eating, you might want to take a look at that book. It's um, newly on Audible. Um, but just from a food point of view, the standard American diet is, is pretty much designed to create obesity. And I have heard of, of um, lifestyle medicine doctors, doctors who are really into this, you know, they'll say to their, their patients who are thin, but who eat a lot of fast food and that, well, we need to check some things out with you because you're eating a diet designed to produce obesity and you're not obese. So let's just make sure there's not, not something wrong. Uh, then the coronary disease, this is a very, very strong uh, evidence. The first came from Dr. Dean Ornish in uh, Sausalito, California, who was doing his research in the late 1980s. And at that time, it was believed that coronary disease could not be reversed via any means. Once you had the arterial plaques, you had them forever. And there was debate about maybe you could stop it. But the idea of turning it around and making those go away, that was just impossible. So Ornish started his study with very far gone heart patients. We're talking about people who had already had bypass surgery. Their prognosis was not good. And his program for them was a virtually vegan diet, very low in fat, meditation, yoga, walking, and group support. And he, he was a yoga guy. He was a, a devotee and friend of uh, Swami Satchidananda who started Integral Yoga. So he really came at this from the kind of spiritual, ethical point of view, not knowing if what would happen. I mean, maybe, maybe it would stop it because that was the best he could possibly think because everybody said reversing it is impossible. Well, guess what? Um, the PET scans were taken and lo and behold, this disease is reversible. And his work was followed up by Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn Jr. at the Cleveland Clinic a few years later with a very similar cohort of extremely sick people. He got the same kinds of results and he only used the diet. <laughs> he's a very pragmatic guy and he's like, I don't wanna do this meditation. <laughs> Let's just give them the food. And, um, and, and he had these wonderful results. Type 2 diabetes. A study was done by the um, 
NIH and the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine with employees of Geico Insurance Company and found that the people on the whole food plant-based diet actually did better with their, their A1C and their weight loss than people on the American Diabetes Association diet. Type 2 diabetes, and when we do need to differentiate from type 1, type 1, which used to be called childhood onset, but now children are getting type 2 diabetes, so we no longer use those terms, childhood and, and adult onset. But in type 1 diabetes, your body simply does not produce insulin. It's a very, very serious lifelong disease. It's absolutely not something to try to treat with diet. However, uh, even for insulin-dependent type 1 diabetics, this diet seems to be a great help. Uh, there's a New York Times best-selling book called Mastering Diabetes. It has a couple of authors. Um, the name of one of them is uh, Cyrus Chambata, C-H-A-M-B-A-T-T-A. -T -T he was also recently on the Main Street Vegan podcast, uh, if, if you wanted to listen. And he was talking about uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetes. But type 2 diabetes diabetes is the one that is largely lifestyle caused. It's the one that is just epidemic in our, our country and around the world. And so many of the places that we used to cite as, as just being such health superstars, we used to talk about China and Japan and how well they did. But now with the fast food invasion from the West, China is has more cases of, of diabetes, new diabetes cases than anywhere on earth. So again, type two diabetes, and yes, on this kind of diet, even diabetics can eat fruit, they can eat whole grains, they can eat beans. This idea that the carbohydrate is the great ill, you know, it's it's just semantic. We give the same word to uh, cotton candy <laughs> and, and, you know, sugary, snacky, nasty, foodless, nothing stuff, as is the true description of fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains. And what you'll learn a little bit later is that in the plant world, there is no such thing. Oh, that's a protein. That's a carb. That's a fat because they're whole foods and they have some protein and they have carbohydrate and they have a little fat because they're whole. And that's what we're designed to be eating. Uh, autoimmune disorders, um, this, these uh, studies are not as um, solid by any stretch as, as for the first three conditions. And some of it is still anecdotal. But what's interesting is that a couple of, of the anecdotal cases are in physicians. So they are really at the forefront of, of looking into this more. There is a um, um, physician, let's see, Dr. Goldner, Dr. Brooke Goldner, she had um, lupus, very severe lupus. And then um, there is another one whose name may be escaping me, who has overcome multiple sclerosis. She actually made a, a documentary about her recovery from a multiple sclerosis. That film is called Code Blue. Uh, which is really worth watching. Uh, and you can find uh, Dr. Goldner um, online. They've both been, again, on the Main Street Vegan program. So there's, there's a, a lot of hope uh, for some of these diseases that we've thought of as mystery diseases and, oh my gosh, what can we do? Well, maybe we can do something. In terms of uh, Alzheimer's and dementia, um, there's a couple named Sherzai, S-H-E-R-Z-A-I, the doctors Sherzai at Loma Linda University in Southern California. They are uh, neurologists who specialize in a brain health and um, they have written a, a book. Uh, uh, um, again, I, I, there's so much information out there. It's so hard to have all of it at the tips of my fingers. But just look up Sherzai, S-H-E-R-Z-A-I. You'll find their book. You'll find their website. And uh, wonderful information about taking care of the brain. And then various inflammatory conditions. And again, not as much uh, specific research, but things like uh, 
ulcers, uh, colitis, um, um, arthritis, uh, osteoarthritis, because we would include rheumatoid arthritis as an autoimmune disorder. But there seems to be a lot of promise for these conditions as well. And before we move on, I just want to talk about the food because everybody loves to know about the food. So these are just typical plant-based meals. So this is some chili and a green salad. You see all those wonderful little green greeneries under there topped with quinoa and then a little piece of uh, avocado toast, <laughs> which I guess uh, the, the chic, chic food of the era. Uh, this is avocado toast on some gluten-free bread, but if you're not gluten sensitive, you could have it on some good wheat bread too. So speaking of food, what do vegans eat? Well, you know, we eat pretty much what those yogis said to eat back in the day. But I have added to the five fitness groups a little plus there is limited amounts of processed foods for convenience, comfort, and familiarity. So it's a very interesting coalition that uh, the vegetarian vegan world is these days because there are many ways to do it. You can do this just super healthy by the book or you can go to Burger King and have an impossible Whopper. You can go to White Castle. You can go to Duncan and, and get these plant-based meat products. Now, some people get all very holier than thou about that and say, well, I, I don't want to eat anything that looks like meat. Well, fine, then don't eat it. But for all those people out there, who've been eating two burgers a day for the past 15 years, you know, we're not going to say to them, here, have some kale. So it's, it's a wonderful thing, I think, that, that Beyond Meat and, and um, all the non-dairy milk companies, uh, Miyoko's Cheese, Treeline Cheese, some of these amazing companies, Miyoko just won a big legal battle out in California to be able to call her cheese, cheese because it's absolutely cheese, but there was some kind of uh, thing that dairy farmers had on the books in California that unless it was made from dairy milk, you couldn't call it cheese. Well, Miyoko won. So these foods exist and they're very different in terms of how processed they are. You know, you can just, just make a field trip going to Whole Foods and reading labels. And some of these are like, you know, isolated soy protein and some of this stuff you might not want to be getting so much into. Some of the oils that they use, you know, aren't the best. Then you look at some other brands and, oh my gosh, they're pure as the driven snow. They're just like what you would fi what you'd fix in your own kitchen. But on a busy night, it's kind of nice to just be able to pull something out of the freezer and have that, especially if you have kids or whatever. So I'm not going to judge anybody for their food choices that don't hurt anybody else. So this um, breakfast is, is kind of, of a mix. Uh, this was uh, in London. And so I'm not sure what brand the, this thing that looks like meat is, but it's some kind of <laughs> veggie meat, uh, sourdough toast, another wonderful little salad and some avocado and some cooked um, greens and tomatoes. Okay, so now let's have breakfast. This is a crunchy granola sweet. <laughs> I'm from the era when granola came onto the scene and it's usually pretty fatty, um, but you can get some Engine 2 granola from Rip Esselstyn. He's written a lot of great books. If you just um, Google Engine 2, he was a firefighter and realized that so many of his young colleagues had off the charts cholesterol and they were not going to live to raise their families. And so he got the whole firehouse there in uh, Austin to um, uh, start eating this way. And they had such great results. So here's another breakfast. I, I love England. <laughs> so you'll see lots of foods from London here. You know, the English breakfast, they like to, you know, cook things and the grilled tomatoes and, and the vegetables. You know, there's a Japanese breakfast with miso soup and little tofu. So, uh, so many varieties. These are my son Nick's pancakes. Uh, the recipe is in my landmark book, Main Street Vegan. 
really easy. Every holiday, uh, Nick comes over and makes the pancakes. It's just kind of a thing. And again, you know, that's another thing I want to say. So my breakfast most days is either um, like stewed apples and, and some oatmeal or maybe the stewed apples and they're still warm and I mix them in with some uh, almond milk yogurt and I put flax seed on there and chia seed and you know I'm a health nut that's how I eat but when Nick comes over on a holiday and wants to make me pancakes I'm having the pancakes so here we have brunch um, my friend Stan uh, it just loves to cook. He's one of these amazing people who's like a food whisperer. So we got scrambled tofu. A little uh, trick on scrambled tofu is if you get something called black salt, and it's not really black, it's pink. I don't know why they call it black salt, but you can order it online or you can get it in an Indian market. It's a high sulfur salt that kind of makes things taste eggy. Uh, so we've got the scrambled tofu and, and the color, that kind of yellow color is mostly from turmeric, which is a fabulous, very high antioxidant spice that is recommended for, for daily consumption. And then we have a couple of um, loaves of Irish soda bread, gluten-free and regular, a nice fruit salad, some little crudités. You know, people wonder sometimes like, oh my gosh, if I eat this way, what will I feed people? Won't people be disappointed? No. Who would be disappointed with a, a spread like that? So we're going to move on to lunch. You know, if you have a big appetite, if you're really hungry, your <laughs> lunch can look like that. Or maybe you're a gourmet <laughs> and you do these other kinds of things. Although, frankly, if somebody gave me that by itself for lunch, I would be going to the Lepan Cotidian around the corner and getting myself some more food. Um, I like salads that mean something. If I'm going to have a salad, I want it to be a meal. And so the way you do that is by adding steamed veggies, particularly the hearty ones like sweet potatoes or yellow fin potatoes. Steamed broccoli is a wonderful thing. I'm going to give you a little broccoli tip. You probably heard that cabbage family vegetables, such as broccoli, have a phytochemical that you can't get in any other food but it's kind of locked in there. So a way to make sure that you're getting all these antioxidants that you're looking for from your, your broccoli is to use a little bit of mustard powder, or you could do mustard seeds, uh, just saute them a little bit and let them pop. Uh, and that'll help you be sure that you're, you're getting everything that you want from the broccoli. You can put beans in your salad, or if you have trouble digesting beans, Go with lentils or particularly split lentils or something called split mung dal that you can get from an Indian market. So that's mung beans that ha have been really chopped up and they're just much, much easier to digest until your body gets used to dealing with um, foods that you're, you're not used to yet. Uh, nuts and seeds, um, pumpkin seeds are very high in zinc. Walnuts have the omega-3 fatty acids. Serve it with some bread, serve it with some soup. And you know, you've got something really great going on. Okay, now here is the new balanced meal. If we're gonna move into dinner, we look at it, you've got the whole grain. This is brown rice and there's all kinds of rice in the world. You know, if you have sensitive digestion, even white basmati rice is sometimes a good choice just until you're used to a higher fiber diet. But quinoa is wonderful. Millet is wonderful. And they're easy to digest in their whole forms. And then in terms of rice, there's also black rice and red rice that in Chinese medicine have all kinds of, of really health promoting um, qualities. Then we've got some, uh, this looks like sauteed mixed greens, kale, collard, really, really high in calcium, in iron, and in protein, which we will be talking about in a little bit. This is a puree of sweet potatoes. We've got some seared tempeh, which is an Indonesian soy food, and then uh, a couple of, of wonderful sauces over here. I can't remember exactly what's in those, but... Um, all you have to do is Google healthy vegan sauce. <laughs> and there'll probably be about 3 million uh, explanations for that and recipes. 
This is something, um, a recipe that I developed for uh, a guy who calls himself uh, Spud Fit. Uh, he decided that he was a food addict, but instead of taking the recovery program route as I did, he decided that, that drug addicts, alcoholics, just cold turkey on the drug. And that was what he decided that he was going to do with, with food, but he knew he had to eat something. So he did research to determine what could he eat and live on until he lost the 100 pounds that he wanted to lose, but, but not titillate him, himself with the idea of all these different kinds of foods. And he determined that that was the potato. And he was actually correct in that. It's really remarkable. Uh, but the potato, maligned though it is, is a, a pretty, pretty decent whole food. It's got vitamin C. It's got all kinds of things. It has enough protein to get you over that um, WHO 5% of calories from protein threshold. So he ate only potatoes. I'm not recommending that. But because he wanted people to contribute recipes with potatoes in them uh, for his book. Uh, that's what I did. And this is just the kind of thing, you know, the, the food part is so forgiving. So if you're somebody who loves food and you like to cook and all that, great. But if you don't, if you just don't want to deal with it, I mean, I've talked to people in New York who say, yeah, I have a stove, but I've never turned it on. Or yes, don't turn on the oven. I keep sweaters in there. So even those kind of people, this food is so easy. You can't go wrong. And even something like a dessert where you have to be a little bit more, you know, technical about getting your measurements right, even that's forgiving. I remember one Thanksgiving, that was the first time I tried to make a vegan pumpkin pie, and it just didn't set up. I have recipes now that always set up, but that one didn't, and it was all loose. So I just put it in um, parfait glasses and called it pumpkin pudding. And everybody was like, this is the best pumpkin pudding. I've never had pumpkin pudding this good. They've never had pumpkin pudding. Who's ever had pumpkin pudding? Uh, so you just work on it and uh, pretty well works out. And you can go to restaurants. So this is a wonderful memory of my last trip to, to London having a, a wonderful uh, Lebanese luncheon in Neil's Yard, which is my favorite part of London. There's all kinds of little holistic places. Uh, so if you're somebody who loves London like I do, do check out Neil's Yard if you haven't lately. And the gentleman over here, if you see <laughs> the sleeve, that's Dr. Milton Mills, who is a fabulous, um, he's a, in, um, critical care physician in Washington, D.C. He's got a lot on YouTube. He has a very active uh, Facebook presence. If you wanted to check out Dr. Mills, who has also been a guest many times on the Main Street Vegan program. So when we're going out, there's a lot of international food that is already vegetarian and much of it is already vegan or very easily can be vegan. So Ethiopia is an interesting story because this is a country that has a very large Christian population and they take Lent very seriously. So for six months, uh, six weeks of the year, a great chunk of the population doesn't eat meat. And so they came up with all of these wonderful kind of bean and, and vegetable dishes. So this is called goman. It's spiced dark leafy greens. And even as a vegan, when I was younger and newer to this, I didn't know what to do with kale and collards and arugula. What is this stuff? <laughs> but when we discovered Ethiopian food, my daughter was a little girl and she was just crazy. You know, you have to learn how to make Ethiopian food. And so, uh, you know, these are just sauteed greens, but really nicely spiced up. And here we've got a, a cabbage dish. And of course, again, the wonderful uh, phytonutrients there in the cabbage family vegetables. This is a lentil dish, and this is uh, a potato. Well, actually, you know what? This is the same thing as this. It's uh, cabbage and potatoes. I like potatoes a lot, so I think that's why it was double. And there are, of course, those were just regular out in the world restaurants, but there are lots and lots of vegetarian and vegan restaurants now too. And this is from one in my neighborhood, Seasoned Vegan, which is just a magnificent 
place, family owned. Uh, when they were building the place, you know, New York is very difficult for starting any kind of thing, any kind of restaurant. There's so many hoops to jump through. So they were paying rent for this place for months and months and months before they could actually open. And what they found by the time they could finally open is they didn't have enough money left for the floor. So they put the word out in the neighborhood if people could just bring pennies. So much of the floor is is pennies. I mean, it, it's remarkable. So every everything has a story, or at least anything worth paying attention to has a story. So we've got some uh, macaroni and cheese, uh, vegan cheese. There's all kinds of vegan cheeses, and there are all kinds of recipes for mac and cheese. My favorite is still the one that I raised my daughter on from a 1964 Seventh Day Adventist book called Ten Talents, and uh, the author was kind enough to give me permission to put that recipe recipe in uh, Main Street Vegan. Uh, the recipe is called Baked Cheese Spaghetti Casserole. But I just want to uh, do a shout out to Seventh Day Adventists for a moment that this is one of the few Protestant religions that actually recommends vegetarianism or ideally veganism for its adherents. It's not required. But because of that, when you look at Adventists as a whole, about half of them eat meat, although they don't eat as much meat as the general population. And of the half that don't eat meat, about two thirds of those people are lacto-ovo vegetarians uh, who, who consume eggs and milk. And again, there are some people who are only lacto-vegetarians and they don't eat eggs, but generally we're gonna lump them together. And then the vegans who only eat plant food. So this is a very popular group for studies for uh, medical studies and health studies, because otherwise they live very much alike. They, they don't drink, they don't smoke, they have strong family units. They are very big on resting on the Sabbath. So they have 24 hours of, of every week when they really truly rest. So all that's going with them. So we're gonna see some health benefits just from that. So to look at the diet, it's only going to be whether they're eating meat, whether they're eating some animal products, or whether they're eating all plants. And generally speaking, you can look these studies up, uh, Adventist 2 studies, a, a great big one, and we find that the more plants, the better. And in terms of, of just um, body mass index, they found that only the vegans were in uh, the, um, you know, the room that they were looking at that, that they considered healthiest. And again, I know there's a lot um, about that, that not everybody's supposed to be thin. I get that. Um, but generally speaking, the things that are harming people and making people sick are much less in the vegan populations. And this is her, oh, this is interesting. Uh, they make crawfish out of burdock root. So if people say, but it's all soy and it's all processed, it's like, you know what? Some of it's just roots spiced up. <laughs> so if you're in New York or if you live in New York, uh, seasoned vegan is fabulous. Right now, of course, it's only a uh, carry out, but uh, the revival of the restaurant will come. So, and just a little shout out to dessert. Um, this is from my friend, Chef Fran Costigan. She has a beautiful book called Vegan Chocolate that I highly recommend if you like chocolate and that kind of thing. And it, it's just to say that because you make this choice, it doesn't mean that you have to become some sort of ascetic. Now, when I made this choice back in 1983, yeah, it was a little more like that because we didn't know how to do this stuff. I mean, we would try to make like banana bread and it would be half an inch high and weigh five pounds. I mean, we just didn't get it. But now all this is known and the food is fabulous and life is good. But will I get all my nutrients? Oh, yes, yes, my child, you will indeed. So I want to talk about protein first because that's what everybody is worried about. And you get protein from plants. That's where the animal got it. So just because we've been fed this line that, that protein is an animal thing, it is not. It is a life thing. To be alive as a plant or animal, you need protein for your structure. So this meal that you're looking at is extremely high in protein. So we've got all these black beans. So beans are, are very high in concentrated protein. 
But then we have the greens. Now we don't think of greens as a protein food, and yet per calorie, dark leafy greens have more protein than beef. Now, admittedly, they don't have a lot of calories, but you've heard of raw food people, maybe you know some raw foodists, and greens are their primary source of protein, and many of them do very, very well. Then we've got some quinoa over here, which is a grain that is, of course, mostly carbohydrate, but it's, it has more protein than most grains, and interestingly enough, it has all of the amino acids. But don't worry about trying to get all the amino acids in a single food or even a single meal, because your body maintains a blood pool of amino acids, and as long as you get them over a period of a few days, you're going to be absolutely fine. Now, a lot of people worry about calcium because just like we think protein means meat, we think calcium means cow. It does not. The cow got her calcium from all of that grass that she ate. And we can get it from leafy greens, great big salads, large portions of, of cooked greens. This is where the calcium lives. In addition, uh, calcium is, is in almonds, it's in sesame seeds and tahini. And if you drink the non-dairy milks, almost all of them are fortified with calcium, either to have the same amount that is in cow's milk, or in some cases, 50% more. Now, you do need to read the labels. It seems to me that the ones in, in the cartons, like the silk, they're all fortified with calcium. But I sometimes get the, the box uh, from, from, I think it's West Bray or Urawan or one of those more health foodie kinds of, of companies just to have on hand in case we run out. And I noticed that those are not calcium fortified. So just be sure if you're looking to get your calcium from the non-dairy milk that you um, look there. And also I've found that at least uh, the Kite Hill yogurt, the kind of non-dairy yogurt that I like, is not calcium calcium fortified. So I don't look to that particular food as a source of calcium. But uh, here's a little, um, little trick. We're talking about iron, but this stuff right here is like an iron and calcium supplement. Black strap molasses, very strong tasting, but you can put it in a smoothie, especially if you've got some cacao or some uh, carob uh, in your smoothie, and, uh, and that can give you uh, a nice boost of calcium and iron. And you can also get iron from greens, dried fruit, beans, quinoa, acorn squash, oh, I said it twice, uh, leeks, and then if you cook in cast iron. If it's particularly something acidic like a uh, tomato sauce, if you cook that in a cast iron skillet, then um, you're, you're going to pick up some of the iron from that. And interestingly enough, even though heme iron, which is, it comes from the red meat, it's from the blood, is more easily assimilated than the iron from, um, from plant foods, it's not a good thing for a lot of people. So if you're a young woman who tends toward iron deficiency anemia, you, you need to certainly be watching your iron. You can do things like soak dried fruit and drink the soaking water, um, at, you know, do the blackstrap molasses. But if you are a male or if you are a woman past menopause, then you just really want to be sure that you're not overdoing it on iron, particularly the heme iron from animal sources, because this can build up in your tissues in a way that can um, predispose you to certain heart conditions. That's why if you look in the vitamin supplements that are for men or that are for seniors, they don't have any iron in there. And there are many, many wonderful uh, vegan dietitians and, and experts. The um, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics has the vegetarian practice group. You can find that online. You can also go to the Plantrition Project if you're looking for uh, a dietitian who is vegan. And of course, if you're just looking for a little guidance you know, from a coach, uh, the Main Street Vegan Academy graduates are all certified vegan lifestyle coaches and educators. And we have something going now until the end of the year that if you have questions, you can get them answered by free. Free, answered free by phone or, or email. So you just go to the um, 
MainStreetVegan.net. And I think the, the slider is a little bit misleading because it implies that this is all about the um, boycott meat campaign, which we are involved in. And this is something because the slaughterhouse workers were told that they, they were in a an essential industry. And so they had to go back to work despite the terrible COVID risk. I think probably uh, the slaughterhouse workers have, have lost more lives to COVID than any other profession. Um, but that if you click on that, you'll see the form where you can get your, your questions answered by, for free by a vegan lifestyle coach and educator. And if it is a question that needs a dietitian or a physician, obviously, uh, we will let you know that. Now, do you need any supplements? You absolutely need one, and that is vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is not reliably found in the plant kingdom, even though sometimes you'll get people that are kind of off on the fringy edges and they'll talk about, you know, you can get it from mushrooms and you can get it from whatever. To be safe and so that you do not develop irreversible nerve damage, take your B12. And some people say, well, that's a deal breaker because obviously it's not natural to be vegan or you wouldn't have to take B12. Well, guess what? The Academy of Medicine says that because B12 is so difficult to extract from animal foods, anybody over 50 should be taking a B12 supplement. So if it is unnatural to be vegan, it is unnatural to be over 50. So B12 is very easy to get. You just, the, the, it comes in all sorts of ways. There, there are little dissolve under the tongue. There's even like patches and nasal spray and whatnot. I get mine in, in compliment and, and you can't really see this picture is too small, but this is a wonderful company. Uh, the, their website is lovecompliment.com and they have, if you see the little bottle here, this is of the basic nutrients that people on plant-based diets probably want to be taking. So B12, absolutely. Now, vitamin D really depends on where you live and how well you absorb um, the, the sun rays that are going to turn into this hormone that is called vitamin D. But most people are going to need some vitamin D supplementation because either you live north of Atlanta where there's just not enough of the sun coming through uh, to give you the um, nutrients that you need, or your skin is dark and, and has that wonderful protective melanin that is going to be great to protect you from the skin cancer and premature aging, and yet it doesn't let the, the sun rays through to make the vitamin D as well. But if you're pale like me and you slather on all kinds of sunblock and you're wearing gloves and a hat with a brim, you're not getting it from the sun either. Plus uh, people differ in, in how well they're able to do that um, conversion. So it might be a good idea to get your levels tested by your doctor and see if you need to be taking uh, vitamin D. And then the other thing that's in this little spray bottle which is nice, you know, for kids and people that don't like to swallow pills, is the omega-3s. And I said we'd talk about that. So the omega-3 fatty acids that people take fish oil for um, come in a vast, complicated <laughs> chemical array. You can get ALA, an omega-3 fatty acid, in the foods that I mentioned earlier, chia, flax, soy, walnuts, and even in um, like foraged vegetables or like if you're out and you pick uh, dandelion greens or lamb's quarters or something like that, um, they, all this, these wild foods have the, um, the ALA. But you have to translate that into the kinds of omega-3 fatty acids that your body can use, and those are called EPA and DHA. Now, we know that this translation takes place, but unless you get a test, which when I had it was not covered by insurance, to see how well you personally do at this, we just don't know. There's some indication that maybe women are better at it than men, but when I had my fatty acid levels tested, my ALA was fabulous. All that ground flax was just doing its job, but my EPA and DHA were almost non-existent because obviously I don't translate well. 
So um, the EPA and DHA in complement and in other um, vegetarian uh, supplements come from algae, which is really where the fish get it to begin with because the big fish eats a littler fish and until you get down to the point where the fish got the, uh, the DHA from the algae. So uh, in addition, um, the complement makes a, a, a capsule that has those three things in it. And it also has zinc, magnesium, vitamin K2, selenium, and iodine. And if anybody wants to talk about any of those in the Q&A, we'll talk about them. Otherwise, just know that they're in there. So I am, in all full disclosure, I am an affiliate for Complement. This is the only time I've ever done this for any company. And that means that I get some little, you know, kickback on, you know, when people buy this. But let me be very clear. All these nutrients are available everywhere. You do not have to buy these products to get them. And if you want these products, but you don't want me to get any money, then just don't put in this discount code. The discount code Main Street Vegan plus with the plus sign uh, in, in all caps will get you. I think it's 10% off. I'm not really sure, but it's some kind of a discount at lovecompliment.com or just, you know, go to the GNC or wherever you go and look for vegetarian capsule. That means it's not made from gelatin, the hooves and the horns of animals who didn't want to die to be a vitamin supplement uh, or wherever else um, on online. There, there are some very good brands. Uh, Pure is a really good brand. Country Life is a good brand. There are lots of, of excellent brands of supplements resources abound. <laughs> so this is my signature book, Main Street Vegan. I love this picture. One of my readers sent it to me with all the, <laughs> the little post-it notes in it. This book came out in uh, 2012. So all of the philosophical and the scientific stuff is just solid, but so many advances have happened with the food. Oh my goodness. Uh, that that stuff is, is uh, you know, it should be updated, except they just printed 30,000 new copies. So I don't know when that's going to happen. Uh, there's also a sidebar there where uh, I'm talking about uh, people of color in the vegan movement and how, you know, there aren't, there aren't so many, but there are some. But now the most rapidly growing group of vegans uh, is African-American women. So it's very, very cool to see so many people um, joining in to this good life and good work. So again, uh, to be on my list, text 55444. Uh, and the word you put in is vegan, and that will get you on the list. And you'll also get this little ebook um, that we originally put together in the spring, and we've actually updated it twice since then because so many things you know about COVID and immunity and all of that have changed uh, and I just want to let you know before we go into Q&A that I am doing a retreat uh, next weekend uh, Saturday and Sunday I think we're going from 10 30 to 4 30 but i'll bet anything we kind of hang around and talk till five um ayurveda is a beautiful beautiful healing system that grew up alongside yoga and it has a secret for doing well in your later years that nobody else knows about. It's absolutely stunning. So I'm so excited to be offering this information, but also a wonderful staycation, wonderful two days of really a lot of self-care. You'll be getting an ebook before the fact if you choose to uh, be part of this program. And in the ebook, um, there are recipes so we can kind of be eating the same sort of Ayurvedic themed meals, uh, even though we're not together, we'll be on Zoom everywhere. And uh, you do get a 20% discount with the code SUB, that's for a subscriber uh, to the Main Street Vegan newsletter. And I'm just assuming you're going to be a subscriber. So, you know, use the code, <laughs> whatever, it's yours. But we're going to have so much fun next week. And again, if you have any questions on that, just uh, email um, Jamie at uh, media at MainStreetVegan.com. Net. And now on to the grand adventure. And it really is. I mean, I am so grateful that I, I discovered this when I did, but it's never too late. I was doing a talk at a library in New Jersey last year and um, a woman probably in her 50s and a woman probably in her like early 80s um, were there and it was a mother and daughter. And the mother, the 80-year-old, 
had gone vegan first and then convinced the daughter to do that. So that's cool. So I see I have misspelled Gandhi. Oh my goodness. That's what I get for uh, copying and pasting. But the great soul said, I hold that the more helpless a creature, the more entitled it is to protection by man from the cruelty of man. Ellen Page, why are vegans made fun of? While the inhumane factory farming process regards animals and the natural world merely as commodities to be exploited for profit. And Alice Walker, wonderful novelist of the color purple, the animals of the world exist for their own reasons. They were not made for humans any more than black people were made for whites or women for men. So, there are officially three minutes for questions, but because we got a late start, uh, I'm happy to go till a quarter till. And again, this is all being uh, recorded. So if you want to hear all of that Q&A, but you can't stay for it, then um, just uh, ask Jamie for the recording. So I am going to stop screen sharing and I'm going to stop recording. Well, should I keep recording? I think I will keep recording. And then at the end, if anybody has a question, but you don't want to be recorded, um, let me know that because anybody that wants the recording should be able to hear the Q&A too, unless that is a problem for the questioner. So if you would like to ask a question, just go to the place on your screen and i always used to say the bottom of your screen but it's different for different people and you can um raise your hand or i think it's under the participant part of the screen it'll say raise hand and if you don't see that then you can go to chat and just type your question in and if you don't see that then unmute yourself and just jump in and uh Ask your question. Make Oh, here. Jai. Oh, one of my favorite people on the whole earth. Hi, Jai. Hey, Victoria. We're both here. We're so happy to hear your talk. It was fantastic. You know what? I am, I am not hearing you. I wonder if it's my headset. Okay. Can you, hear us now? Can you speak up a little bit? Yes. We... Sharma and I are both here. Can you hear us? Um, not very well. Uh, Charmaine, I see your picture there. Can you hear Jai? Just wave your arm if you can. Okay, I'm going to yell. Yeah, not very much. Okay, <laughs> we, we, we can hardly hear you. Okay, um, we're going we're gonna to speak very, very loud. Now we hear you. Okay, great. This, this was an amazing talk. We were blown away. Both Sharma and I are sitting here with baby Jai. We were amazed. And we had the quick question that came into our heart because obviously you received something powerful from going vegan. This was, and, and you had mentioned 1969, you became vegan, which was inspiring for everybody. What, what, what was it about, when did, you, when did you cross the bridge to start sharing veganism? You had ah. to test it out. You had... And what, what was that that made you cross the bridge? Because your compassion is exponential right now. We're, uh, we're so touched. Thank you. Uh, I will answer your question, but first I want to let everybody here know who you guys are. And I forgot to say, completely slipped my mind, when I was talking about uh, the Ayurveda seminar next weekend, that um, there will be two guest um, presenters. Um, one is Dr. Sarah Kuchera, who is a practicing uh, doctor of chiropractic and Ayurvedic practitioner and the author of the Ayurvedic Self-Care Handbook. And the other guest presenter is Richard Masla, who is the director of the Ayurveda Health Retreat in Alachua, Florida, which is just heaven on earth. I went there for an Ayurveda course, and then I just took the yoga 
training course from uh, uh, Jai uh, Shama, Shama's sister Diana, and the rest of the family and extended family. Um, and it, it's just amazing. They have um, other courses in, in uh, yoga, Ayurveda, and all kinds of uh, essential oils and things. So do look up uh, Ayurveda Health Retreat. So to answer your question, so I went vegetarian in 1969. I didn't even hear the word vegan until I guess it was 1971 because it just wasn't known back then. And at that time, even being vegetarian was just considered so weird, so dangerous. You know, pe people always, you know, basically wanted to know how long you thought you'd live. <laughs> and it was just a, a very different time. But I started being vocal pretty early. So I went vegetarian really because of yoga, because when I got into yoga, when I was 17, there were three books available in the Kansas City Public Library about yoga. And they all said, well, if you're going to be serious about yoga, you have to be vegetarian. And so I managed to do that. It took, took me a while, took me a couple of years, uh, but I, I managed to do that. But it was difficult for me because I was a practicing binge eater. And so I'd go on these eating binges and I'd go to the 7-Eleven and I'd look for my stash and, and everything always had whey in it or egg albumin. And I'd finally just throw up my hands and say, oh, heck with this vegan thing. I'm just going to eat what I want. And then when I would want to, you know, pull myself back together, the dietary advice at that time and largely now as well was, you know, uh, non-fat yogurt and egg white omelets and you know i mean like it's bad enough that you're vegetarian and eating all those carbs much less that you want to be vegan and eat all those more carbs so i had a lot of struggle but even when i was struggling when i was vegan i believed i was vegan i mean i i wasn't like vegan for three days thinking tomorrow i'm not going to be vegan anymore i really thought i was doing it and so i i started writing articles for the American Vegan Society, and I recommend that you check them out. They were, they were the only game in town uh, at, at that time, and, and they're just wonderful people, AmericanVegan.org. So I started writing for them, and then um, I met the editor of Vegetarian Times Magazine when the magazine was still like stapled together, <laughs> and I started writing for him, and then I started writing for Yoga Journal, and, you know, it took me a while to become vegan, but people believed in me, uh, uh, particularly uh, Freya Dinshaw, who is still at the uh, American Vegan Society, and her late husband, Jay, they just, it, it, they never treated me like, oh, you're the one who goes on and off the wagon. They just held me up in their belief that this was something that I could do. And uh, I think largely because of that, I did. But I started talking about it right, right off the bat, and I haven't stopped. So, ah, oh, there they are. Beautiful. And do we get to see little Di? Oh, hi there. <laughs> In, in our yoga teacher training, he would visit. It was so perfect. It was just fantastic. Oh, here's somebody joining. Uh, okay, let's see. There are, seem to be some questions in the chat. I am looking for recommendations for animal cruelty-free, vegan, or organic uh, facial and body products. Hi, Bonnie. Thanks for your question. Yeah, this is a whole other part to this thing because it's one thing to have this wonderful, humane kitchen, but then we have the other parts of our homes. So yeah, in terms of the cruelty-free, it's gotten very, very easy in the non-testing part, at least, to find wonderful products, whether you're looking for body care or, or color cosmetics, um, that you can go to leapingbunny.org or you can go to PETA.org and, and they have all the listings of companies. But some of the big companies that are just easy uh, to find, like Aveda is one, um, and uh, ELF, E-L-F, Eyes, Lips, and Face, they're nice and uh, low cost. 
um, physician's formula has stopped testing. Wet and wild uh, <laughs> in, in the drugstores uh, no longer test. And then there are wonderful upscale companies like Neil's Yard Remedies that I mentioned, like Dr. Hauschka. So uh, yeah, just go to Leaping Bunny or to PETA. You can get the whole list. And then if you're also interested in non-toxic products, which is a really good thing to be interested in, uh, you can go to the Environmental Working Group, ewg.org, and look at their listings of the less toxic products. And what's interesting is that generally speaking, if it's cruelty-free, it's going to be non-toxic and vice versa. Not necessarily, but pretty close. Also, um, many vegans um, consider honey non-vegan. When I became vegan, that was left up to personal conscience. So I just, you know, don't get into that. I mean, we could talk about it privately or you can read about it. But if, if uh, honey is not something that you want to be um, purchasing, then that's in a few products. There's uh, occasionally, there's going to be some lanolin, which comes from sheep's wool. And people are like, well, what's wrong with wool? You know, that's like getting a haircut. Unfortunately, it's not um, because the shears are paid by volume. It's very horrifying for the sheep. It's done very, very quickly, very cruelly. Sheep in Australia, where most of, of the wool comes from, are subject to this awful practice called mucin sling where the, the skin on their little backsides is is just sliced away so that it will um, heal with a scar and no wool will grow there so that they won't um, be infested with a kind of fly that is a problem to the industry. So wool is just not a great thing. Lanolin's not a great thing. So there are a few of these little kind of piddly. And I mean, you know, I don't mean piddly in that the the cruelty down the line was not important. It's very important. I mean, I certainly don't wear wool or, or any of that. But I also think that, you know, we don't want to sweat the small stuff like, oh my gosh, there was a little bit of, you know, beeswax in this cruelty-free organic lipstick. I, you know, I just did a terrible thing. No, you didn't. You know, you just bought something and you weren't aware and next time you'll buy something else. I think it's very important that we, we be committed, but that we also, you know, be flexible enough to, to live in the world. So I hope that helps with the body care products. I also want to let you know about um, household products, because from the health point of view, most of us have toxic waste dumps under our sink. I mean, I was cleaning a week or so ago with some stuff that I had ordered that was like the CDC approved for killing coronavirus or something. Well, you know, it was pretty much CDC approved for killing Victoria Moran. I was really into the scrubbing thing when I got it. You know, this stuff is burning my lungs. I mean, you know, the stuff that they can sell to people to use can be so, so dangerous. So you want to get the... Uh, seventh generation or the method or the Mrs. Myers clean day, or you can just clean practically everything with club soda, baking soda, uh, white vinegar, and just, you know, so nobody's being tested on. There's nothing outgassing that you're breathing that isn't good for you. So body care and household stuff, we can really really um, upgrade that. And I'll just touch on clothing a little bit too. So when you become vegan, do you have to get rid of all of your shoes and belts and wallets and handbags? <laughs> you know, if you're rich and you, you have, you know, somebody that you can give those to, so you're not just polluting with them, sure, you know, go out and replace everything and start fresh and have a heyday. For most people, that's impractical. So you just use what you have until you need to replace it, and then you replace it with a, a vegan item. And we used to be, you know, we had to like, well, you know, it, it's cruel, it doesn't harm anybody like animals, but it's some kind of horrible PVC that's not good for the planet. We no longer have to make those kinds of choices because now the stuff that you get 
that is vegan is also almost uh, universally um, eco-friendly. And there's some amazing products coming, uh, fabrics from bamboo and pineapple. It's just incredible. And so you can just shop, you know, you can shop online. There are uh, companies like a Grape Cat uh, has uh, lots of, of clothing. Um, if you're a man and, and you need some really upscale, very nice looking uh, clothes and shoes, go to bravegentleman.com. And um, the, the designer there, Joshua Catcher, is also the author of a, a just beautiful photographic book called Fashion Animals that talks about the fur industry, the leather industry, the wool industry through history, and also about the fashion industry in general and how that industry has trained us what is beautiful. But you know what? We know what is beautiful. So uh, happy shopping. It, it's all great. And we don't need, you know, tons and tons of stuff because we got a planet to protect too. But I find that when I buy something that I know is just good on all levels. I got a white organic cotton t-shirt yesterday. I'm having this thing. I think it's it's you guys' fault, Jai and Shima and the um, yoga teacher training. I just want to wear white. <laughs> and so I got this t-shirt and it's that fabulous organic cotton and it feels so wonderful. Um, so, you know, it's a nice feeling, you know, I mean, we all probably, most of us like to shop and it's nice to have something new, but when you know that it's, you know, at least to a degree in keeping with, with the planet and with, um, so that all life can celebrate, not just us. Is there a test that can tell if you're getting enough B12 and can you get too much B12? Yes, Perita, there are a couple of tests for B12. And the one that is usually given is not as good, particularly if you're a vegan and if you eat a lot of leafy greens, because we've all heard of the nutrient folate. And when it, it's artificial, like for vitamins, it's called folic acid. And just uh, a little aside for anybody like you're pregnant and they want you to take folic acid, take folate. Uh, Dr. Joel Furman, F-U-H-R-M-A-N, has a line of supplements, and he has a folate supplement. So it's just what you need, you know, for the development of the baby and all that, but it's not the artificial folic acid, which um, can lead to, to breast cancer later. But for Perita, for your question, if you get a lot of folate in your diet, which you probably do because you are a plant-based eater and you eat a lot of leafy greens, that test could be wrong because the folate in your blood could be misinterpreted by the blood test as vitamin B12. So you need to ask your doctor for the urine test. And I believe the letters for that are MMA, which are obviously the same letters as mixed martial arts. So maybe that's not quite right. But I actually do think it's the MMA test. Anyway, it's a urine test for B12. And um, you can tell if you're getting enough. Can you get too much? I'm sure that in theory, because of bodies being different and everything being so possible, it is probably possible, but it's certainly not usual. And that is because all the B vitamins are water soluble. And that means that if you get more than your body can use, you just pee it out. And also you do not need very much um, vitamin B12. You take it in micrograms where most vitamins are gonna say milligrams. So I don't trust my memory for numbers. You can look anywhere online. You can, you know, it's in Main Street Vegan, um, how much B12 you need and you can supplement either daily or you can do it weekly. You can just get, you know, a bigger, bigger amount. Um, if, if you're somebody who, who doesn't want to have to think of something like that every single day. Let's see if there are other questions. Okay, I don't see anything in the chat. And I don't see any hands up. Okay, so uh, it is exactly 1245. How did we get that perfect? So thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Please be in touch if you have any other questions. I am here to help you and, and to help make this world kinder, saner, more sustainable, 
healthier and uh, all that good stuff. So thanks to everybody for being here. I hope I see some of you at the uh, Ayurveda weekend next week, although since that's about aging, probably if you're under like 45, you won't want to come. We'll have to do another one. <laughs> that's for everybody. Okay, all take good care. Be well. Bye. Oh, and thanks for all these, thanks for all these beautiful compliments. Bless you.